experience of winter and spring is that it translates so much to the lives that we live. It gives us such a grounded metaphor for what we experience and um, it helps us make sense of so much. As we journey in life, we long for the winter months to turn the corner so we can enjoy the spring reality of new life. You see, when it comes to the life of faith and following Jesus, new life and a new way of living is a hallmark of being united with Jesus. So we're going to open up the scripture shortly, and I want us to understand what it says to us this day right now about new life. And we're going to be heading over to Romans 6. So if you have your Bible, if you read it on your phone, we're going to be heading over there shortly. And what I want us to understand about the book of Romans is that it was in the New Testament and the Apostle Paul who was basically given this great task to spread the unifying good news of Jesus was writing to these great group of believers, maybe something similar like here, of people in Rome. And basically they had a lot going on. There was a lot of people, a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of diversity. And he wanted to know about being united with Jesus and what that looked like for their new life in him. Uh, so he goes on and he starts talking to them. And one of his main intentions was that they would understand being united with Jesus and what it looked like for them both as individuals, but also collectively as a church. So Paul starts off with explaining being united with Jesus is in his life, death and resurrection through the act of baptism. So let's read together from verse 3 here. Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Jesus was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. There is a lot going on in here, a lot of imagery that Paul is giving to us. Okay, but when I see this word resurrection, one of the best and most relatable ways for us to understand it is it simply means raised to new life. Something that was once dead and dormant is now raised to new life. And it is a representation of Jesus being raised from the dead to new everlasting life. So baptism is understood as this unifying with Christ moment. It is going to be a physical action that displays a spiritual reality. So just as you can imagine those people in Meribah right now who are being baptized, they know in their hearts the spiritual reality that Jesus has given them new life. And they take this physical action of going under the water to represent being buried with Jesus and coming up to represent the ultimate new everlasting life that they have because of him. It is a sacred moment for these people that is going to mark every other moment to come in their lives. It's like what we see with the baby dedications. When we say that these children have a purpose and a hope and a future in God, we know that already. But when we mark the moment, it is a sacred moment that is going to mark the moments ahead for all those young lives. And we see this even more profoundly when a bride and groom exchange their vows at a wedding ceremony. Look, I don't know about you, but weddings, I'm bound to cry at least one time, maybe several times at a wedding. Um, and the one point that I'm going to shed a tear at is definitely when the bride and groom exchange their vows. You see, there's something about this tangible expression that they give um, to this inward reality of their commitment and unity. You see, when we're in a room and a bride and groom are being married, um, we know that we're there for their love. We know that they are committed to one another. But once they give this tangible expression to their love, to their commitment, to their ongoing unity, it creates a sacred moment. It is a moment that is going to turn that bride and groom into a husband and wife. It is going to start their new life and new way of living together. So how many of us who have said vows know that life is a little bit different when you get married? You know, your diary is a little bit different, all those type of things. So that sacred moment, and when it's expressed in the presence of God and community, it just captures and gives tangibility to this unity and new life that they have. So we're seeing, again, a physical action of a greater 
reality at play, a sacred moment that is going to mark all the moments ahead for this new husband and wife. And we see these amazing and significant events happen, and they are amazing, and they are impressive. But what happens after that? How do we continue in our unity together in this? So I want us to go back to that passage, but more specifically in verse 4. And we're going to read something which I really believe captures what we're meant to be doing with this unity. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, that we too may live a new life. God's ultimate intention for us is to be united with Jesus so that we may be be living a new life, not an average life, not the old life, a new life. I love another translation. It says it this way, that we may walk in the newness of life. It speaks of a freshness and a fullness that is meant to be in our lives. Another thing that I observe with this is that it uses an active tone with the language, that we may walk that we may live, that there may be a fullness there. It doesn't say that we may take a seat in our new life or we may take a nap or take a rest or just watch our life go past. No, it says that we're going to walk in the newness of life that Jesus has given us. There's action to it. There's forward momentum to it. There's something to be experienced in it for you and for me. And by definition, when we are taking some action and walking into a new life, by definition, we're going to be walking away from some old things. There's going to be some old ways that we're going to leave in the past. Because who knows that when you step into something new, just like with that spring clean, some things are just going to go. Because you need to make space for the new to have its full and expansive reality that Jesus has given us. Now, Paul, again, he doesn't want to waste any time when he's writing to the church in Rome, and he uses, again, some really strong ways to get across this point. So we're going to continue reading on in verse 6 right now, and this is what Paul says. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. You see... Paul is saying here that we need to not only put it away, but kind of put it away once and for all. He uses this word crucified because they understand that Jesus was crucified, as we understood before, to put things away once and for all so that the new life can be there to be lived. And it's not to deprive us. Can I let you know that is not the intention of putting away these things. It is not to deprive us. It is for the ultimate outcome to make space for Jesus' new life to reach his expansive reality. It's so that new life can overflow and extend into every part of our everyday lives and that this new life can be proof to others that we are united with Jesus and that we are living new life in the fullness of what he has for us. You know, he keeps up bringing up this fact that we have to die to old ways so that our new life living can happen. Just like that life change that happens for the bride and groom when they become husband and wife, they start experiencing that life is going to be different in this new way. And we, when we live united with Jesus, we too live in a different way, in a new way, because it's a new life that we have begun. And it's a gift from him. It's such a gift. I want us to all this morning understand this gift that new life is a bit more. So I want to ask you a question. Um, Have you ever heard a story, or maybe you know of someone personally, that's had a second chance at living their physical life? Maybe I'm really mindful also as I ask this question that that could be your story in this room today, that you could have had a second chance at living your physical life. I know someone that had a second chance at living their life, and that person was my dad. Now, my dad lives on the East Coast in New South Wales, and um, although that our, we have long distance to our relationship, we make sure that we're always in contact and just seeing how he's going, but my dad, for quite a few years, has suffered with excruciating back pain, 
And particularly about two or so years ago, it was quite bad. And he was uh, multiple visits to the doctor, multiple visits to the hospital. And basically, they kept on treating his back pain. They kept on treating his back pain because there was a lot to be managed there. All the while that they were treating his back pain, there was a quickly developing chest infection for him. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't got in time and he was sent home. And as it rapidly developed on one of his last breaths, he was able to call triple zero and they were able to come to his home and they were able to get him while he was on his last breath and save his life. Those paramedics that day gave my dad a second chance at his life. Now, my dad had smoked for quite a while he hadn't drunk a lot, but he was a casual drinker and enjoyed a few drinks after work. He's a very simple man. Um, I love him dearly and he thinks the world of me. And, you know, the next day the paramedics came to my dad after he had a very um, quick emergency surgery to take care of what was happening in his chest. And those paramedics said, mate, we thought we were looking at a dead man. We thought that we didn't have a chance, but we were able to save your life. My dad was beyond grateful, and every other person in my dad's life also beyond grateful that they were able to save his life, that they were able to give him a second chance. And my dad now, he lives in new life. You know, the old ways that held my dad before do not hold him anymore. They belong in the old ways. He, if I ask him, Dad, would you have a cigarette or smoke a drop of alcohol? He says to me exactly how long that he hasn't touched one because he knows that it belongs in the old life. He's like, Monique, nor do I don't want to do that. I want to do all the things that they are wanting me to do with my new life now. He not only, you know, has this more spring in his step and he gets up in the morning and he goes for his walks. He cooks these amazing meals. He tells me all about them, like his lasagna is amazing. Um, he does a lot of baking as well because he knows these new things serve his new life that he was given and he wants to walk in that every single moment and how much more is this true for us spiritually when we realize that Jesus is the one that has given us a second chance at life that he is the one who has given us he's given to us new life we have a deepening desire to live differently when we are grateful for new life we don't take it for granted you know, just like that spring clean, some things have to go and it is not to deprive us, but it's to make space for the expansive grace of Jesus in your life. Paul goes on and he, like I said, he's got a lot to explain to us and he talks about this deepening desire of obedience because of grace. So we're going to read from verse 13. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. Everything about us, our body, mind, and our spirits have been created for a specific purpose. Let's take this into the context of another instrument, a car. Okay, you wouldn't buy a car, no less a new car, simply to crash it, right? That's a bit of a wicked use of that instrument of the car. Of course not. You're not going to go and crash it. You're going to take care of it. You're going to ride, uh, drive on the road. And you're going to obey the road rules. And you're going to be mindful of all the other cars around. And you know, if it gets a little nick on it, you're going to make sure you buff it out because you love that new car. And as the years go on, you're going to maintain that car. You're going to pump up the tires. You're going to take care of that instrument. You want to use it in the right way. So what Paul is saying here is just like that. You wouldn't take a new life just to crash it. Of course not. That is not the created, intended purpose for your body, mind, and spirit. God has created you for right living. God has got purposes for us to live in a new obedience that is fueled by the grace of Jesus. This is what it looks like to offer every part of ourselves in a pur as a purposeful instrument of righteousness. There is a deepening desire for obedience because of the grace and gift of Jesus. I have this quote that I love from G.K. Chesterton, and he is a gentleman from the 19th century, a great well-known theologian and writer. 
And he profoundly captures some of the sentiment that Paul talks about, about being brought from death to life and not being under the law, but under grace. And G.K. Chesterton writes this. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. Jesus came to make dead people alive. See, we understand that there is a disconnect between humanity and God. We understand that we are created, uh, surrounded by created things and we want them to fulfill our lives, but really it is the Creator Himself that we want to be connected with, the Creator Himself that we want to be the one informing our value. Somewhere along the lines in the journey of life, we realize that we are alive, but maybe not fully. We realize that we could be surviving and existing but not thriving. Maybe we realize that we're created by, uh, surrounded by these created things, trying to get them to fill us, but really we want the creator himself, God himself, to be our all-fulfilling source. Maybe we could get to a point where we feel we're lost and we just need to be found. We just need to be saved. We need someone to save us, to give us a second chance. You see, like my dad, he couldn't save himself. He couldn't, couldn't give himself new life. Someone had to do that for him. And in our spiritual lives, there comes a point where we realize we can't save ourselves. We can't repair the separation from God. But there is someone who is Jesus that can do that. that the person who has provided a way for us to be reconnected through the power of the Holy Spirit to God the Father to fulfill us. Jesus is the one that we unite with and makes our new life possible. And as we understand this more, that Jesus came to make dead people alive, it is said all throughout the ministry of Jesus and continuing on today as well. His ministry was full of these things called miracles, where he brought life to dead situations. All throughout the scriptures, there's a few examples I just want to share with you this morning. There was a, a woman who had suffered from a complication of blood for years and she knew that Jesus could bring life to her dead situation. She approached Jesus in faith and knew that if she could just touch the hem of his garment, that Jesus could bring life to her dead situation. And it happened. There was a Roman soldier who had one of his servants lie dead at home. And the Roman soldier said, I knew the power and authority, authority that you have Jesus, and Jesus, if you would just say the word, you don't even need to be at my house. If you would just say the word, I know that my servant can be healed. And Jesus was impressed by his faith, and surely Jesus brought life to that dead situation, and the servant was healed. There was a blind man who found himself in the presence of Jesus, Didn't, couldn't see him, but knew he was in the presence of him. And Jesus knew that he was blind, but he still said to this man, what do you want? What do you want me to heal for you? And he said, restore my sight. So Jesus, by that man's faith, restored his sight, brought life to that dead situation. And finally, friends, the ultimate miracle, the ultimate miracle when death became life, when on the third day after Jesus' crucifixion, when he died a sinner's death, just as he said he would, he rose from the dead. In that moment, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus conquered death and rose to new everlasting life. You see, sin and its ultimate consequence, death, no longer holds its finality or its potency. And what I mean by this is that there is a new, there is, sorry, there is a reality that sin and death still exist. We know that these things are still part and part of life. But because of Jesus, it doesn't have the final word and it doesn't hold any power. For all who believe, Jesus has the final word. That is grace. And Jesus holds all the power and that is new life for us. I'd like to invite the band up. And can I let you know that I've just been loving um, sitting in this um, passage from Romans 6. And as I've been with it for a few weeks now, I really wanted to meditate on it and understand what God want us, wanted us to understand about new life and being united with Jesus. And I have to let you know that I had this phrase really stir within me and impress upon me, and I'm going to share it with you. The gift of grace is not wrapped in grave clothes. The gift of grace, that is Jesus, 
is not wrapped in grave clothes. And this brings me to the account of Jesus when he was risen in the Gospel of John and his close friends, the disciples, as it was the custom, went to the tomb on the third day and they went to look and see the dead body. But just as Jesus said, he wasn't there. He had risen to new everlasting life. The resurrection had happened. However, this account in the Gospel of John does say something specific. It says that the grave clothes were left in the tomb. The things that wrapped and restricted the dead body of Jesus did not belong on the new resurrected body of Jesus. And how much more is that true for us when we follow Jesus, that things are not meant to wrap and restrict our new life. They're not meant to at all. We have to follow Jesus in this. So the question is for us today, for me, I've been asking myself this, for you today, I invite you to ask yourself this as well. What are some grave clothes that might be wrapping and restricting you? What are some of these ill-fitting garments that just don't belong anymore? They need to be like that spring clean, they need to go. What do you have to take off and leave behind for once and for all? You know, maybe it's old habits that don't serve your new life. Maybe it's old ways of thinking, doubts and fears, whether they've been put there by yourself or someone else, but they are in opposition with the truth of God having its fullness in your life. They don't belong there anymore. Maybe it's something like unforgiveness that's just showing up in all other ways in your life. It doesn't belong there anymore. You know, I'm mindful that God in this moment can bring up specific things for us when we think about the things that wrap and restrict us and don't belong in our new life. And I want to remind you that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And when he brings these things to mind that he wants us to deal with, that he wants us to leave behind, that it's in his kindness, in his mercy, and most of all, in his grace, that he leads us to deal with these things. So we need to be like Jesus and we need to leave the old things that wrap and restrict us, the old ill-fitting grave garments, where they belong, just like Jesus showed us in the tomb. We need to live a new resurrected life. They need to stay there so we can be free and stay united with Jesus and walk in the newness of life that He has gifted to us. He's given it to us. It's so it's so amazing when we see that it's his generosity that has given us this new life and we have this gratefulness and gratitude for it. Now, you might have seen it a few times, my message on the title come up. <laughs> um, but the reason why we need to leave these old things behind is because ultimately the new life, the new life of Jesus looks good on you, friends. It looks so good on you. You know when you wear something new and someone notices that it's new and they notice that it looks good? They're like, where did you get that from? Can you tell me a bit more about that? That's, you know, new life. It looks good on you. There's some hallmarks of our new life united with Jesus that look good on all of us. Gratitude looks good on you. Joy looks good on you. A renewed mind with the grounded truth of God looks good on every single one of us. The peace of Jesus that surpasses all understanding looks good on you. Compassion looks good on you. Faith looks mighty fine on all of us. Courage, boldness looks good on you. Maybe picking up some healthy habits for this new life that you have looks good on you. And finally, I love what it says in the scripture, it says, put on the all-purpose garment of love that binds this all together because it looks good on you today. You know, God has a whole new wardrobe of new life ready for you to put on. Everything that He has is good and every good thing He has, He wants to give it to us because it looks good on us. Now in this moment, there's so many ways that we could be responding to God. But what I love in these moments is that sometimes our response, our best response is to have full-on gratitude and full-on praise to Jesus, who knows that we have been given something that we could not give ourselves. There is so much gratitude that we can express to Jesus. So we're gonna do that for this new life that we have been given. 
So we're going to praise together. I want you to get you to stand to your feet. We're going to finish our time together with that song of praise that we had in the beginning. It mentions these lyrics that it's no longer I that lives, that Christ that lives in me. I want you to sing these as declarations. Sing them as truth. Sing them to renew your mind. Because in this place this morning, praise looks good on us. Let's praise Jesus. He's worthy of all the praise. He's worthy of all the honour. His name is above every other name. His name is above every other name in this place. Let's continue to praise Him in this place.